wow, everyone is more awake than me today. What is this? Normally it's the opposite. Normally I've had enough coffee and I have to, have to try to get y'all woke up a little bit. But All right, so y'all going to have to help me stay awake this morning. Does that sound good? All right. Okay, so um, first off, Will, thank you again for, for a wonderful job, man. You, you always knock it out of the park. Um, I'm really, really thankful for that. Um, yeah, because if you guys don't know, I mean, he, he's been ready since the first part of the week. He asked me what the verses were, and within like 20 minutes, he comes back and goes, hey, these are the songs I'm doing, boom, and he just, he's ready to jam it out. And I'm like, I don't even, I don't, like, I don't even know what pants I'm wearing today, and you already got all this ready to go? What in the world? <laughs> anyway, thank you. Thank you very much, Will. I really, uh, I really do appreciate it, because I am not gifted in that area at all. Um, if you guys are not aware, we are continuing today in our Matters of the Heart series, and we are in wonderful week number three. Um, over the cur- course of the first two weeks, um, Jason has, has dealt with uh, a couple of different topics. In the first week, we, he talked a lot about the differences between the philosophy of the heart that the world has told us and then the philosophy of the heart that the Bible had to tell us and the reality that the, the world wants you to follow your heart and place the heart first and chase that sucker all the way down the road. And then the Bible turns around and tells us that guy is not someone that you need to be following. Do not follow your heart. In fact, the Bible turned around and said the exact opposite and said that you needed a heart transplant. You needed to take that dead heart out of stone and have it replaced with flesh. He went in the week after that, and he even started talking in great detail about, um, about what it even means to keep the heart and to guard the heart and how that's a great duty of, a, of the Christian to, to protect our heart and to, to place a guard around it because it's very easy for us to wander away. It's easy for our heart to see something and go, cool, I'm going to follow that down this path. So that was uh, the three-minute blurb of, of what Jason has done over the last couple of weeks. I encourage you, if you have not listened to them, please go back, uh, listen to those two sermons. They were, they were phenomenal. Um, so this week, we're actually going to begin diving into, um, as we're going to do for the remainder of this series, we're going to talk about areas areas of the heart where we are where we are more likely to drift or wander, places where the heart kind of has a little bit of a weakness. We're going to do that today by going into Philippians uh, chapter number 4, and we're going to start in verse number 10, and we're going to work down through verse number 13. Now, I already know what you're thinking. I love verse 4, 13. Just about everybody does, right? But I can do all things through Christ, like that that verse, right? Okay, so we're going to talk about that today. Um, But we also want to talk a little bit about here because in these final statements that Paul makes to the people of Philippi, here at the very final portion of this, of this letter, he lets us in on a little bit of a secret. So I'm going to read these verses, but before we get into that, I want to say this, um, that I was struck a whole lot with these verses this week, and I've, and I've had to toss them back and forth and flip them around a whole lot because the, the idea that I had in my mind as I read them the first time or as I was getting ready to, to, to preach this sermon, it kind of got stood up on its head there. But anyway, I'm going to read these verses first, and then we're going to dive into this one, okay? Starting in verse number 10, it says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at length you have received your, revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, in this little section, Paul gives us the very thing that we're going to talk about today. And that's the ups and downs of life. When life sends you plenty and when life sends you nothing at all. When you're at the peak of the hill and at the valley. So today we're going to... We're going to be talking about guarding our heart from the hills and valleys of life. Now, this may sound like a strange thing to say, because when we talk about the valleys, I'm pretty sure everybody in here is like, hey, I can get behind that. Talking about how to guard my heart in the valleys is something I'm, I'm ready for, but talking about the peaks is kind of a little bit different and a little bit strange, but we're going to talk about that, uh, that first this morning. But I want, to, I want to point this out in verse number 11, and this is the reason that I say that we're going to dig through this in, in this fashion. In verse number 11, Paul says something really interesting, and it's even more interesting when you, find, when you read it in its original Greek language, when he says that I have learned in whatever situation that I am to be content. 
This one little English word is summed up all of Paul's experiences in life. The word specifically being used here tells us that everything that he has gone through, from his days when he was walking and persecuting Christians to the moment he stands in right then where he's been chased out of towns, where he had people attempting to kill him left, right, and sideways, where he has had plenty at his side and where he has had absolutely nothing. Every single experience he has faced has taught him one overwhelming lesson. And it's because of that that today we're going to look at three different lessons on guarding our hearts. Three lessons from Paul's journey. So we're going to learn vicariously through Paul today. But this idea of learning this path is an interesting one. Because Paul didn't start off here. Paul had to teach himself this. Paul had to be taught these things. This wasn't something he just kind of woke up one morning after he had been saved and said, I know how to, I know how to stand firm when everything is good and when everything is bad. I know how to stand firm in every situation today now that I've been saved. This is something he had to learn. It's something he had to grow into. It's something that he had, he had to be taught and he had to experience. Now, like I said, we're going to talk about three big lessons coming out of this, this little bitty section. And it's because of the reality that Paul has learned them that we're even calling them lessons. But the first thing that I have to tackle is lesson number one. All right, now you're going to stick with me here a little bit, hopefully. And I don't, I don't wander too far because I've got a ton to go through, unfortunately. The very first lesson that we're going to talk about today is that life is hard. Okay, now let, let that sink in. Life is hard even when it seems easy. Now, this little bit of, of a comical statement, but I want, you to, I want you to look at it here. Life is hard in good times and in bad. We usually have absolutely no, a prob- no problem agreeing to the statement when life is going wrong, but we are much more skeptical when things are going well. Now, just because I'm saying that and because this phrase is a little bit comical, I don't want you guys to believe me on this one. But I want us to start and look back at Paul's, at Paul's letter here, starting in verses 11 and 12, as we begin to build this theology out of the Bible. Um, and I want to throw this word of caution out here, too. I know I'm a little bit all over the place this morning, but that's, that's because there was so much material to digest um, uh, before I even got up here that it's, it, it's got my brain running about 1,000 miles an hour. I want to say this to you. I'm telling you to guard your heart at the peak of the mountain and at the valley, but I do not want you to listen to me, Okay? I want you to hear this out of Scripture. And if I cannot show it to you in Scripture, I do not want you to listen to me at all. It was brought to my attention uh, Monday night as Jason, and I, as Jason and I talked about a whole new philosophy that has crept up inside of the church at large that blew my mind. And we talked about it at length, and he kept trying to, to rationalize it for me and say, well, this is, this is why these people believe that. They're wrong, of course, but this is why they believe it. And as I sat there looking at him, I'm like, but God's word says this very clearly. God's word says this. God's word says this. So here's the thing. Pastors and, pe- and preachers, no matter how many PhDs they get, no matter how much education they get the opportunity to do, no matter how many years they get to preach, are just men. If we do not show it to you out of God's word, please, please, please don't believe me. Okay? And, and I beg that of you. If I, if I distance myself from God's word, I want you guys as my church, as my family, to walk up with a stick and hit me and say, hey, you were way out of line. Get back into the scriptures, brother. All right, that's, that's my begging plea for y'all, but I also want to say that one too because that, and we don't have time to get into that one. I wish we did because that's a, a whole other can of worms, but it has, it has thrown me for a loop all week that we can be led astray so easily by hearing clever phrases and clever, and, and clever statements. So when I tell you that life is hard, even when it's easy, that's just a way for us to remember this setup, but I don't want you to, to believe anything that I have to say because maybe that line was clever or it stuck with you. Believe it if I can show it to you out of this word, okay? Anyway, that was an entire side note. I'm sorry I ate up time just with, with that one already. So let's take a look at it in God's word when we say that the very first thing that we need to understand is we need to dispel this notion that life is easy, okay? Life is hard. Even when things are easy, life is hard. You are in a struggle. You are in a fight. You are in a never-ending war, even when times are going well. Notice this one. In verse number 11 and 12, Paul says it this way. He says, now that I, Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, 
I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. He doesn't just, he's not just encouraging the Philippian church here by telling them that he's learned how to get through the hard times in life. Even though he's talking to them and trying to give them encouragement and say, find your peace in the midst of the difficulties that you're currently facing, he includes these other statements. He includes these other words that are being there. He said, even when how to be brought low and how to abound. He said, I've learned how to handle each of these situations. He doesn't exclude them. In fact, the Greek word abound is perieso, which means to be over and above, to abound, to have an overabundance, to be lavished on. This is to have so much that it spills over the top. The word plenty that he uses here is, I'm going to butcher this one, but cortazo. It means to feed, to fatten, and to fill and satisfy, to be so full that you're popping at the sides, to have more than you absolutely could need. So Paul is using extremely expressive language here, talking not just about staying the course during times of hurt, but also about times when we would not normally warn people at all. Normally when we're facing times of plenty, we wouldn't say anything. God, I've got plenty. But it's exactly in these times of plenty that we are really, really tempted to walk away from God. Now, we don't say that that's what we're doing, but we do. We start to drift We don't pray as often because we're not in need. We don't continue those disciplines again because we're not in need, quote unquote. It's very easy in our greatest times to wander. Now we don't, and again, this is a slow wandering. It's a slow, gradual path that kind of takes us where we think we're on the path one day and the next thing we know we're way off out here in the woods. But our hint is not just found here in these verses in Philippians. I want, to go, I want to go to a couple other places for us to dive deeper into this concept because maybe I'm reading too much into this. Maybe Paul adding this letter is just him being eloquent because Paul is, is nothing if not eloquent. This guy can lay down some seriously wonderful statements. But let's jump on over to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. Now we're going way, way back here, okay? But in Deuteronomy, it says, And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant, and when you eat and are full, take, then take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. So here we're jumping way, way back into the Old Testament. And one of the first things he warns his people about, he goes, when you enter into that place that I've promised you, when you walk into Canaan and you get all of these cities that are pre-made and you get all these wells that are already pre-dug and you get all of this stuff that is already ready for you, when you enter into the great blessings that I've given you, the first thing God says is you need to be aware unless you wander away from me. So the idea is even back here, way back in the Old Testament, that we have a tendency to wander when times are good. It's who we are. Likewise, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, he says, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. Now, I want to say this. He's not saying that money is necessarily evil, all right? And I, want, and I guess I need to throw this warning out there. I'm not saying you having things is a bad thing, okay? Having stuff and having a good life, having a job, having plenty on the table is not a bad thing. These are just warning signs because if we are not aware, if we are not guarding our hearts, we can let it cause us to wander away from God. Just as he tells Timothy here, this desire to become rich has caused this individual that he's got in his mind to push God to the wayside. Just as he said it, it has caused some to wander away from the faith. Likewise, out of the mouth of Jesus himself, if, this was, if, if these other verses were not good enough, in Mark chapter 10, verses 23 and 25, it says, And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult will it be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? And the disciples were amazed at his word, but Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter 
the kingdom of God. Now, we're going to go back to Mark chapter 10 here in just a, just a few minutes, but I want you to see what Jesus is doing here. Jesus is telling them it's not impossible, but all of this great wealth, all of these things are a warning sign. It's something to raise your guard against. It's something to keep the guard around your heart. When times are plentiful, we are really likely to wander away from our first love. We're willing to wander away from our God who's brought us to where we are. Now, I can go on and on here, but hopefully this, this, these couple of verses here kind of gives us the picture that Scripture warns us repeatedly that our heart's tendency is to wander away from God in times of plenty, especially when we've got everything going for us. That's the time that we start going, and we just forget. We stop thinking about God because our heart's first inclination is to keep chasing after self. Now, what about when times are rough? I know this may seem like a no-brainer, but there's a giant danger here as well. We also have this tendency when things are just a little bit bad to try to shoulder the burden and muscle through it, not looking to God at all. Or in these dark times and difficult times of life, we have an overwhelming possibility and a tendency to despair and to start thinking things about God that aren't true. We begin to begin wandering off the path and letting the darkness pull us in a different direction and go, ah, God's not protecting me. God's not watching out for me. God's allowing these things just to, to happen to me. There's no reason for this. There's no hope left in my life. Now, at the top of the hill, it's easy to stop looking because we seem like we have everything. There's no need for God. At the bottom of the hill, we're in such great need that we can't see anything but the pain that's in front of our face. In both of these situations, it's an overwhelming difficulty. But again, I don't want you to believe me when I say it, okay? Look at the entire book of Philippians. Paul writes the entire letter to the church at Philippi because of the difficulties that they're getting ready to face, because of the struggles that they're seeing in their world. In fact, partially because they see that Paul is in a Roman jail cell when he writes the letter. And he write, he's writing to them and saying, I know I'm in jail, but that's a good thing. The glory, God is being glorified in this. People are being saved through the testimony of these events that are going on. He writes this letter as an encouragement to the church at Philippi not to give up and not to lose hope in difficult times. Likewise, if I jump over here to Matthew chapter 5, in verse 25, Jesus gives us another wonderful one. He says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, whatever you will eat or whatever you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. It not, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you, are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Now, Jesus takes time here in the Sermon on the Mount to expressly tell us not to worry. Guard your heart against worry. And then he gives out all of the reasons why. But here, and what we could honestly say is Jesus' inaugural sermon, the big one, the, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is taking his time and saying, guard your heart against anxiety and against worry. So that very first lesson that we have to get down is we have to dispel this notion that we can be lackadaisical, right? And that's easy to do and easy to say when times are tough. It's a lot harder to say that when times are plentiful, but no matter what, we have to realize that the Bible is telling us constantly, your heart's tendency is to pull you away from God. Your, its tendency is to draw you as far away as it can possibly get. Be on watch. Be on guard. Put the sentries out. Don't let yourself wander. Because if you do, if you sit back idly, you will wander. So lesson one is remembering that life is tough. And lesson number two is have a slice of pie. Just make sure that it's humble pie. 
All right, now, the next lesson is entirely designed to answer the problem of plenty, to answer those times when you're sitting on the top of the hill, is to remember to have a slice of humble pie. Because part of the problem is, is when we get to the very top of the hill, we believe that we've gotten it all, that we're completely self-sufficient, that, we're, that we've got everything that we need. We have no need for God. We can put the Bible on the shelf, let it collect dust, and everything's fine. Now, we don't actively say this, but it's the way that we actually act out our lives. We stop worrying about it. Prayer is not as important when there's nothing to need, right? Now, let's take a look at this in verse number 11 again, and we're going to do a little bit more of a Greek, a Greek study. Um, the word he uses here when he says he's content, he says, not, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. So what does he mean when he says content? The word content, and I'm going to butcher this one too. I'm sorry I'm throwing so many words in there because I'm not good at them. A tar case, all right? Meaning self-sufficient. But the way that this works in the Greek language is whatever it's tied to is what is giving him the sufficiency. Now, normally in, in any kind of Greek literature that you read, when they say then use this word, they refer directly back to the self. They're referring to themselves. They are self-sufficient because of whatever power they've managed to amass, whatever their position is, whatever they have has gotten them where they are. But Paul ties this wonderful little word back to Christ. In this paragraph, he has rooted it back to Jesus. Meaning this, that Paul has found entire sufficiency in Jesus. He is saying what has allowed him to stand up when times have abounded and when he has plenty and he's gotten so much that his belly is so full that he couldn't put in another morsel is that he is sufficient in Christ. He is not looking at himself and saying, I'm all this in a bag of chips. I've got it all figured out. I've managed to have this 10-step point process for my life that has allowed me to invest wisely and do these things and made me safe and, and given me a home and roof over my head. No, I haven't done these things. I have them, but I am sufficient in Christ. Now, Paul understands that the founder and perfecter of his faith is Jesus. When I say that we have to take a, a bite out of humble pie, well, the thing that we need in these times when we're facing plenty in our lives, the way, the easiest way to guard our heart is to remind ourselves of where we came from, to remind ourselves of how we have salvation at all. And it's not salvation out of me. I didn't stand up and win my own salvation. I didn't work myself into the kingdom of heaven. In Philippians chapter 1, verse number 1, Paul starts it off and says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and the deacons. He even opens his letter and says that the whole reason we're talking is because we are saints in Christ, that we exist inside of Christ. The foundation piece of our faith is Christ. And just a few verses later in verse number six, and he says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So again here, he's looking, saying the person who began the work in you is the same person who's going to end the work in you, that this person is Jesus. He doesn't tell them that you guys have done it all, that you guys are all great and wonderful, and because you're so fantastic, you've saved yourself and you're going to bring yourself to salvation. He says, no, the person who saved you is the person who's going to complete the work. The foundation piece of our faith is now and always will be Christ, and we need to remember that. But let's take a look back at the Old Testament again. Looking at King David, all right? Now, King David has this wonderful view of himself in 2 Samuel chapter number 7, verses 18 through 22. Now, this is when, when the Lord has come down to David, and David has got overwhelming amounts of wealth, but yet the Lord does not have a temple of his own yet. And he's commanded David to build him a house. It says, Then King David went in and sat before the Lord and said, who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that you have brought me thus far? And yet this was a small thing in your eyes, O Lord God. You have spoken also of your servant's house for a great while to come, and this is instruction for mankind. O Lord God, and what more can David say to you? For you know your servant, O Lord God, because of your promise and according to your own heart, you have brought all this greatness to make your servant know it. Therefore you are great, O Lord God. For there is none like you, and there is no God besides you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. Now David, standing at the top of the hill, has this perfect perspective. 
he looks out over everything and he says, who am I? Everything that you've given me should remind me only that you are God and you alone are God. Everything should point me back to you. This humble heart right here is guarding David in these moments. Now, David will forget later on. David will mess this up royally. If you don't believe me, read all of David's story. That cat can mess some stuff up. But in this moment, David knows who has founded his faith. David knows who has protected him. David knows who he has to turn back to, who is responsible for his position in life, for his salvation. Remember what I said, we're going to go back to to the, the book of Mark, right? We're jumping back to chapter number 10, and we're going to keep going where we left off with verse number 26, okay? Jesus, and, went, and they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? Now, of course, the disciples are all out of wax here. They've heard that people that they know to be successful, that they think have it all. Jesus has just said, it's going to be really, really, really hard for these guys to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And so now they're terrified. They're like, if the people who have it all, the people who seem to have everything together and have all the stuff that seem to signify some shape, form, or fashion of blessing, if these people are in a dangerous spot, how in the world am I going to make it? Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Your salvation is built on the thing that you could never do. It was impossible for us to save us but it was not impossible for God. So when we're standing at that hilltop and looking out over everything and everything is together, we need to stop and look back and go, I am here and I am blessed because God is the one who has brought me here. My salvation is not built on me, it's built on him. I have everything because he has given me everything because before him I had nothing. Before him I stood entirely apart from God and enemies with God. Paul will write in Romans chapter number five, verses one through three, it says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And the implication here is, is that the position that we stood in before we were justified by faith was one of an open enemy to God. And after the work of God, we were at peace with him. But much more than that, we obtained access to God. And when it says we have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We were pulled into a brand new position from enemies standing in opposition to the mighty God to part of the family, enjoying the grace and the peace that comes with that. Likewise, the, reader, the, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted in your struggle against sin. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Paul has this very same mindset, clear as day, when he writes these letters, when he writes, writes this letter to the Philippians. He can write to the church at Philippi and say, I know how to stand at the top of the mountain unafraid that something's going to draw me away from my God because I remember that my God is the one who bought me. I remember that before I came into relationship with God, I was his enemy. Before this point, I was dead in my trespasses and sin, and he replaced that heart of stone of mine with a heart of flesh. Before this moment, I was nothing. So he can look back at that and say, this is still where I stand. All glory be to God. Praise God that I'm standing on the top of the mountain. But likewise, he can also say, it doesn't matter if I'm on the top of the mountain or at the bottom of the hill. It doesn't matter because God is the one thing that sustains me in all that I do. And that's going to lead us into our third lesson today. We can guard our hearts against that temptation to wander 
when we're at the top of the hill by reminding ourselves that we were lost when he found us. We can call back to mind that moment of salvation and let that wash over us and return us to a place where we go, oh, I remember God. I remember all that you've done, with me, done for me and that pulls me to a place of worship and a desire to follow after you. But when we're at the bottom of the hill, Paul likewise is talking about this as well in this, in this section in, in Philippians. When he says he knows how to be brought low, he knows how to have absolutely nothing. He knows how to be completely debased, devoid of anything. So how can he say that as well when he say that from this exact same perspective? Our third lesson today is don't lose hope because your help is right there with you. Now, the other two are funny, and I didn't make, I tried not to make this one funny, but sombering for a specific reason. Because I don't want to make light of suffering. Suffering stinks. It's hard. It's difficult. Suffering is one of those things that can draw you away and beat the hope out of you with a stick and, and leave you there for long periods of time. And we don't like to talk about it in the church because we don't like to acknowledge defeat. We don't like to acknowledge hurt. That may sound strange, all right? It really might. But think about it. When somebody asks you how you're doing, even when you're hurting, a lot of times you're going to go, I'm blessed. When what you really want to say is, I feel like I have been beat with the stick of life and I can't get up. I feel like my legs are broken. I feel like I tripped down the hill and I feel like I got mud all over my face. That's how I actually feel today. But we don't want to say those things because we hear like what Paul says earlier in this very same thing when he says rejoice, always rejoice. So we don't want to talk about the reality that we feel beat down. But here's the truth, that Paul was very aware that suffering will beat the hope out of you. It will beat you with that stick. It will drag hope out and throw it out into the pasture. Suffering has a way of doing that. Suffering also has a way of distorting your view of God. C.S. Lewis said it wonderfully um, in, in reflecting on his, his own wife's death. He said that he didn't fear that he would ever come to not believe in God. He said his greatest fear was coming to believe something about God that wasn't true. And likewise, for us, this is a place we get into. As Christians, we're, we're not very likely to ever jump to that other side of the fence and say, nah, we're atheists now. But we are very likely to begin believing things about God that aren't true, that God doesn't care, that God's not there in the small moments, that God isn't there uh, in the midst of suffering or pain or difficulty, that God has somehow forgotten that there is absolutely no hope in this world and the only thing we can wait for is the sweet release of death and then it's all said and done. But that's not the case because Paul is writing again. I need this to be clear. Paul is writing from a jail cell in the middle of Rome. You want to talk about a bad jail? That's bad jail, okay? Rome is as bad as you can get. And he is sitting in there with an emperor who's ready to lop his head off at any second. And yet he is saying things like, I rejoice, I have hope, I know that there's an exceeding joy that is within me, and I know how I've gotten here because I'm fully sufficient in Christ and my help is near at hand. And that leads us into verse number 13 where he says the most beautiful line, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. His strength is not in himself. He doesn't look to his own strengthened reserves to make it through the day. He doesn't try to push himself back up the hill or encourage himself by saying, Paul, you can do it. Paul, you've got a little more in you. He looks back at Jesus and says, you always have energy inside of you. You are always ready to go. My strength is you. The energy reserve I have to make it through the struggles and difficulties is in you. Let's jump back just a couple of paragraphs. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Paul starts off and says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So here he's even talking about guarding his heart by placing a full and entire trust in Christ. And the thing is, he's not trying to whip him into a frenzy. He's not just trying to say something spiritual. He says it right there at the beginning. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Let this be something that's reasonable. It's logical. It makes sense to trust in God.
But let's see how he words it out to the Roman church. Now, remember when, in, before we, we left off in verse number three, right? And we're going to go back to Romans chapter five, and I'll read verses three through 11 for you. He says, not only, not only that, but we rejoice. Now, remember before in Romans five, he was talking about the founder of their faith was Christ, that they were justified by faith. They had that right standing that they've remembered now, and that has tempered their reality. He says, but not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. To put it simply, Paul just said that where God found you, you were his absolute enemy. You stood in direct and utter opposition. And if at that point in your relationship with God, he was willing to go to the cross for you, why do you imagine now at the bottom of the hill that he would somehow suddenly abandon you? That he would somehow leave you completely on your own, that he wouldn't supply you the strength to get through it. For some reason, something so small as providing you with the energy to make it through your struggle or to bring about your good because of it. How would he bother with doing, not doing something so small when when he called you your, his enemy, his absolute enemy, he was willing to save you, that he went to the cross when you were in direct opposition. Paul continues this thought in Romans chapter 8 in verses 15 through 39. This is going to be a little lengthy one, but stick with me. It says, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if we are children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Now, remember, this is the cat that's in jail in Rome, okay? When he says he's, the present sufferings that he's facing, he's talking about having his head cut from his shoulders. This is the same kind of guy that's talking about this level of suffering. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected futilely, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we await for it with patience." Now he's talking again in the midst of suffering. Remember, this is all talking about the pain and that hope that sits in it. And that hope is there because Christ has bought you. And if Christ has bought you, then that means you're an heir with him. That's where we're at right now. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. For we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes with us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? And it is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? 
Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God and Christ Jesus our Lord. That entire section is pounding home the reality that at the bottom of the hill, you have to remember that you are absolutely not alone. You have to beat back the urge of your heart to stand hopeless and defeated. You have to, to cage that sucker in and tell it, no, this isn't real. This is, this is just some tendency that you want to walk away from the fight. But the reality of the matter is this, that God bought you, and if he bought you, he's not going to turn you loose. There's not anything in all of creation that can pull you away. You can't claim demons will do it. You can't claim rulers will do it. You can't even claim that angels will pull you away from God because it's not going to happen. There is absolutely nothing in all of creation that will do that. And the proof is in the pudding because what Paul offers up as proof there is that you were an enemy, and when you were an enemy, Christ died for you. When you two didn't like one another, when you two were quarreling, however you want to put it, when you were as far apart from one another as you could possibly be, he walked up to the cross and died to bring you back into the fold. If that was the point that your relationship started in, then nothing else past that, everything else after that's downhill. Anything else he does for you after that is a small thing. And so it's nothing for you to look at him and go, he's not going to leave me alone when times stink, when the job's not there, when, when I suddenly find myself with no money in the bank account, or when people can't stand me right now, or whatever the case happens to be. You're not going to be abandoned. So you have to turn around and look at your heart and go, I don't think so. You can't lose hope. I can't lose hope. There is absolutely no way to lose hope because God has given me a hope that cannot possibly be quenched. So I want to end this one out by reading Psalm 46 to you because I think this also encapsulates exactly what what Paul feels in this moment when he tells them that in all things, in everything, he can do it through through that strength. It says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear that the earth gives way, that the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a stream, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, and she shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage and the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice and the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth and he breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God and I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. So the guard around our heart today to protect us in times of plenty and in times of nothing is the same thing, is an utter and entire trust in God. Not trusting in ourselves for our own salvation because that's not the way it worked. We were lost and dead in our trespasses and sin before he found us. So remembering that keeps us humble. At the bottom of the hill, though, When hope seems like it isn't there, we can also turn and go, my God was there for me when nothing else mattered, when nothing else could be. When I had nothing, God was there for me. And how much more will he be there for me now? He is a refuge. He's a fortress to stand around my heart and guard it from itself and keep it right where it needs to be, trusting in Christ. Um, That concludes our sermon today. How do you want to do this, brother? Will, if you want to come up here and, uh, and end us out, I'll pray real quick while you get set up. And uh, if you need prayer or anything, I'll be down front um, and be happy to pray with you. We've got Andrew here. Where'd he go? Right there behind us as well. And Andrew will be happy to pray with you as well. And, of course, Brother Jason. So uh, let's pray as, uh, as Will gets ready to, to do our invitation.
Dear Heavenly Father, I want to, uh, I want to thank you so much for your steadfast love, for your mercy, um, for the grace that you've given us that gives us uh, hope and reconciliation that can keep me, can keep me humble when I honestly want to just point at me and go, yeah, I'm great. Thank you, Lord, for reminding me that, that you are the founder of my faith, for keeping me where I need to be because that is what my greatest good is. And Father, thank you so much when days are dark and, and overwhelming that you are not leaving me there by myself, that I don't sit in the valley and weep because I have someone there who provides me the strength to make it through all things and that I have a hope that is unbreakable. Father, we just want to say that we, we love you and we thank you for all that you do for us. And it's in your son's precious and holy name that we pray these things.